Okay, <clears throat> we're on Galatians 1.14 now. Let, let's back up and see how I translated it in verse 13, because that kind of helps us a little bit. For ye have heard of my manner of life in time past in Judaism. Now, remember, we, we, we make the point that Judaism is not exactly the same as following the law of Moses. Judaism included more than the law of Moses, it included the traditions that they had added to the law of Moses. How that beyond measure, I was persecuting the church of God, was persecuting, that would be an imperfect tense, and I was laying it waste, okay? Now then, and I advanced in the Jewish religion, that's Judaism again, okay? So I don't know who started first last week, but, but whoever, but whoever started second, would you start first today, if you remember? I started last week, I believe. <laughs> In other words, Chris, I'm letting you go ahead and take the lead. All right, I'll take it. Uh, Galatians 1.14. Please. Kai pro ek opon en to eudesmo huper palus sune le ke keomtas en to gene mu peri sostur us zeleto zeletes hupa ar tone tone um patricon mu para dos uh, uh, dus own. Uh, I have and I and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more abundantly uh, zealous of the traditions of my fathers. It looks like I yeah I added of my and there are many of my con, uh, contemporaries among my countrymen. Okay. All right. Oh no, that's in there. I don't know why I put that, but move. It's in there. All right, so I profited, I advanced, I went beyond, see, I lengthened, <clears throat> I beat forward. It's like a hammer, a forward beating metals. And I, I outdid them. Is that, is that be, okay, the way Oklahoma people would say it? I just outdid them. I beat them in the race, okay, I was ahead of them. I advanced in, what did you say, Judaism? Yes, Judaism. Yeah. And I think that <clears throat> in this context, it includes more than following the law of Moses. It was a corrupted form of the law of Moses. Beyond many of my own age. So I advanced way beyond others of my own age. Of my among my countrymen. Now let me point out. I think in epsilon nu, most of the time when it's used with a plural, it should be among. All right, like this among my countrymen, and it, that's how it's translated here. I believe that's good. And uh, so I think there's passages we need to look at them more again, look at them again sometimes. All right. Uh, say Corinthians 6 is a good example, verse 6, 14 through 17. My countrymen, these of my own genos or genome, or that's race, my own race, and my countrymen, fellow Jews. And he tells us he was zealous for the traditions of the elders. See, this is what we see in Matthew 5, 15 and Mark 7. That Jesus came in conflict with the Pharisees. Jesus did not come in conflict with them when they had a correct interpretation of the law of Moses, never did. He commended them for it. But when they added their traditions and their traditions added weight and duties to people that God hadn't given them, they added more weights upon them, loaded them down with other burdens when they did this. 
then they were adding to God's word and they were adding their traditions to it. As the Jews, including Saul of Tarsus, had followed the Old Testament scriptures, they would have accepted Christ. When he followed the Old Testament scriptures, he began following Christ. Jesus said to the Jews, you search the scriptures because of them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that bear witness of me. Properly interpreted, the Old Testament scriptures point to Jesus. Right? Being exceedingly jealous, this is an adverb, or abundantly, uh, we have uh, to the greater degree, we have three modes of it. We probably could look this word up in, uh, let me see, we could look it up and see it. I want to get over into another, the other file and look it up. And, I want to get out of the file. Now it doesn't help us, okay? Let's see if I can find it again. Be something. We have different degrees of these adverbs and, and also of adjectives. The positive degree, the comparative superlative. I think this is a superlative degree of it. In English, good, better, and best. See, that's your positive degree is good, comparative is better. You're comparing one thing to another. One is better than the other. Then superlative, best, okay? And I think that's, that's what we're running into here. I think it is superlative degree. All right, but I'll have to do some more work on that. Did you see the file I had up? Mm, no, sir. You couldn't. Uh oh. Oh. Something's trying to happen. Could you see it now? Yes. Okay. Well, I was. I thought I had a file up with it. Uh, I think it's superlative degree more abundantly. I think it's. Uh, there's abundant and more abundant and most abundant. Uh, it might be compar comparative degree. Uh, all right. So right here, ex being exceedingly zealous and a burning desire. But I was zealous of what? What was I zealous for? What? Traditions. Traditions. See, that's where he was getting in trouble. That goes back to what we said here earlier. And we get back into Matthew, these two passages here and other passages. When Jesus had confrontation with the Pharisees, it was always over tradition. And they had missed or, or they were misapplying the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, misunderstanding them. And whenever he got in trouble, got in conflict with the Sadducees, he, it was over the fact that they had the problems with the resurrection angels and spirits and so forth. And the Sadducees only took the first five books of the Bible. And Josephus tells us this in his writings. And I intend to make up a a, a set of lessons on stuff like that that will be helpful in interpreting the Bible. I'm trying to weigh that into the hermeneutics or at the end of the hermeneutics, maybe. 
But the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Bible, Pentateuch, since the Acts of Davis, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and so when Jesus confronted them, if you'll notice and you study through, he never quotes from anything except the Pentateuch to address their his conflicts with them. Okay? Because that's all they accepted. And uh, so he uses what they accepted and showed that even the books they accepted refuted their false doctrine. Does that make sense? Any questions? No, it makes sense. All right. And uh, again, this is laid out for us by Joe Cephas. I'll, I'll get that later and have a series of lessons on that being exceedingly zealous for the traditions. Now, there's nothing wrong with traditions as long as they don't conflict with God's word or place, place extra burdens upon people. And that's part of the problem with them when you place an extra burden upon someone. Is it a tradition that the uh, church assembles at a certain time uh, where, where you worship there, James, on Sunday morning? Yes, sir. And there's nothing wrong with that because the church can assemble on the first day of the week, can't they? And they're obligated to. So they can set the time and it's not wrong for them to set a time. And it may be nine o'clock, it may be 10 o'clock or some other time. But we, we assemble at 1030. You know, that's the scriptural time. That's my joke. But whenever I grew up, the church that I worshiped with when I was a boy, we assembled at 10 o'clock. Instead of 10 30. So it was a different time. Uh, and so we assembled 30 minutes later than we did at the little country congregation where I attended. So what we have is that's a tradition. Now we can't assemble and have our regular assembly on Saturday, for example, because it has to be on the first day of the week. But that's another question. But what we have is, as long as it's on the first day of the week, then uh, the church has the right to decide what, to, what they're going to do. And in this case, it becomes a, it's a tradition, but it's not binding upon the church, something that God hasn't bound. It's just taking care of the timing of it. I think we can do that. I think we have the right to do that. And the church can have the Lord's Supper before the sermon or after the sermon. It, and uh, it's, the Bible doesn't answer the question when, when, when it should be. And, all right, so, but traditions that would bind extra things that God hasn't bound upon the church, uh, I don't believe that, that that's what the Pharisees were doing. And, and I was, and I advanced, how did you translate it again now? Let's, let's see what your translation compared to mine, if you would, back to this. All right. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of uh, my contemporaries among my countrymen being more abundantly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. More exceedingly zealous, more abundantly zealous, same thing. Okay. And is this, he translated this right here, and I will advance in perfect. You say I was advancing. I believe your translation is a little clearer than mine. It brings into that. And I was advancing. I will change my Okay. All right. I like your translation. Well, thank you. Beyond many of my own age, because that's in perfect tense, right? Right. All right. Any other questions or comments, sir? Anybody else? Do you have anything to add to that, James? No, sir. I I did note the imperfect there as well in my translation. The next verse for us, James. And I think we have uh, Russell with us tonight. He's new, uh, Chris. I think you were in the class and you kind of met him, but 
right? It's a lot of no fault, okay? All right. James, okay. verse 15, please. Yes, sir. Hot de ek quelias metros mu kai kalesas diates caritos autu. And I translated that. But when God thought it good, he set me apart out of my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Okay. Call me through his grace. And that when God, and so the article is, and I've never found a passage where the Theos God is used with the article that it didn't refer to the true God in the New Testament. So that's that's laying out the true God. Okay. Uh, who separated me, the one. See, this is a participle, isn't it? There's participle, the one separating me. And this is our word horizon comes from it. Or read so. A boundary, a word horizon comes out of this word. And the offer primitive says not a horizon, so there's no horizon, no boundary. Right. No horizon, no boundary. He separated me from out of, that's where the egg out of my mother's womb. Colium, a colon, see, the colon. That's your, that's your belly. And the, that part of your intestinal, that lower part of your body there, right? And he says, and call me, the one calling again, this participle again. Now I want you to notice something here. And it's the one separating, notice the article out of the belly, my mother's belly and calling me. So this is a participle. So why doesn't the second participle have the article? Help me out there. It doesn't, why doesn't it? Would that be Sharpe's rule? Yes, general Sharpe's rule. So that's telling us that the one separating and the one calling or what? The same. They're the same person. Person, see? That makes sense? If they were different persons, it'd have an article with the word kalais. Kalaisos. Kalaisos. They'd have an article where my, where my uh, cursor is right here. Right here. All right? Paul was called to apostleship through his grace. Now, the grace here could be the grace by, by which he was saved, or it could be the grace of apostleship, which didn't come until after the ascension, see? Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. Paul received his apostleship by grace, by the grace of God of 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul considered it a favor that he had, was, had become an apostle. It was a favor of God. He was put, favored by God. And some people, I, I get some people that someone asked them to would do something for the church or uh, such as lead singing or perhaps uh, teach a Bible class or something like that. And they say, I just, I just, I don't, I don't think I want to do that. And uh, but what it ought to be, it ought to be a privilege to be able to do this, to, to do these works for the Lord, okay? But some people, it doesn't seem like that to them. It seems like a drudgery, all right? If he didn't straight to the word grace, I believe is used for Paul's apostleship again as well. And so he's not called until the grace system arrived, and we are not saved until we are called by, by the name of the Lord. 
Acts 22, 16. So God called him because he's honest hearted. That's why he called him. And we call on the name of the Lord when we are baptized, when we obey him, actually. And in this context of Acts 22, 16, it's by being baptized. So this participle calling explains what you do when you're baptized. Calling on the name of the Lord. And Paul was thankful that, that he can be faithful, put him in his ministry. Right? Because of the blasphemer, persecuted, injurious. But I turned mercy because of it ignorantly. I was, I was ignorant. I just didn't know what I was doing. Didn't understand the truth. Calvinists like to cite this passage along with Isaiah 49 1 and Jeremiah 1 5 as evidence of their view of predestination. Calling, but the problem is calling one to be either a prophet or an apostle is hardly the same as calling one to salvation. I think these passages here in Isaiah and Jeremiah both talk about the men being called to it being the prophet. And we say that Job will have called me from the womb, Isaiah 49, 1. Me, Jeremiah, Isaiah, say, and in order for me to be a prophet, he chose me that way. Same thing with Job, with Jeremiah. He knew me, see, and he appointed me. I thanked by the and appointed me as a prophet. The word separated is found in all these passages here. Right here, I've highlighted. <coughs> but when God was pleased, He separated me out of my mother's womb and called me through His grace. <coughs> and who separated me? And this would be the one separating me. I think I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that. The one. Separating me. Out of my mother's room and calling me. Through his grace. Now, then, what did you, how did you translate it there, James? <clears throat> I uh, said, but when God thought it good, he set me apart out of my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Okay. And I had me as elliptical as well. <clears throat> Chris, you have anything to add there? No, that's good. Let's go back to, back to Chris, if you would. It, it is interesting how broad the word coleus is. And that uh, belly, womb, and stomach as well, it's used. So it's pretty generically used word. Or intestinal tract is what we might say. Yes, sir. Or, so, okay. All right. Verse 16, and back to Chris, I think. All right. Um, Apo Kalufsai, tone. We own Hatu in Imoi Hina Uangeliazomai Hatu in Tois Ethanesin Euthios U Proson Ethe Main Sakri K uh, Amati. I have to reveal his son in me, even me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Immediately, I consulted not with flesh and blood. Okay, we were just in the subjunctive mood in the last class, in the Greek class. There's subjunctive. You know, that. so that's a purpose clause, you know. In order that him and uh, Atone in the Gentiles or to the Gentiles, among the Gentiles. Right. And so immediately, straightway, 
in Berber Manor, not I conferred. Okay. All right. To reveal, and that's Apocalypto to uncover. So this infinitive here to express the purpose of the separation of call of Paul. Separated me to, to, to preach, see, to reveal his son. In or among or by me, I think that would be by me. Among the uh, the book that in order that I might preach. I might preach him, that is the son, among the Gentiles, right? Uh, what Gentiles was Paul chosen to preach to? Well, Gentiles and kings, Gentiles, but later we'll find he was sent to the Greeks. Okay. <clears throat> so he was sent to the Gentiles, but specifically the Greek speaking Gentiles. And other apostles were sent to other places. Okay. Any comments there? Straightway, immediately, say. And this proves that the calling and the revealing occurred in Acts 9. Paul was called to the grace of apostleship in Acts 9. God did not confer. Now, why is he telling us this? What's, what's the problem? What's the problem we laid out in the last two weeks of class? Last two class periods. Are we talk, talking about him being for his apostleship? Or is that what we're talking about? He's defending his apostleship here? Yes, I believe he's still he's laying it out, still defending his apostleship. He's going to do that into chapter two, even. All the way into chapter two. I did not confer. All right. So I didn't confer. I didn't consult with flesh and blood. Well, now, flesh and blood would, would be, I didn't consult with any man. And he could have consulted with God, though, with the Holy Spirit or with the, an angel or with the Son, God the Son or with God the Father. So he could have consulted with any, of the person, any person of the Godhead and or an angel. So that wouldn't be flesh and blood. So I did not consult with other human beings and probably the apostles in this context. It's middle voice here. Paul of himself did not seek out other human beings for guidance. This implied God directed him. So I did not confer. Eris, middle voice. Eris is the middle is separate form in Eris, remember. So I didn't do it. I didn't of myself seek this out. And so this tells me that God was directing him and telling him what to do. His apostleship could have been questioned if he went to Peter and was taught by Peter, but he wasn't. He got his directly from, uh, from Jesus. This information. Now, let me lay it out here. With other human beings, specifically the, the apostles, now that's your middle loss. Does not rule out him conferring with other beings, either deity or angels, as I let say it out just a moment ago. Here's my first argument. If the only way one could learn the gospel was through either a written copy of the New Testament, or through revelation from deity, or direct teaching by other persons who knew the gospel, I think that's the only three ways you could get it. Then, uh, and the revelation from deity could be through an angel. Then Paul either had a New Testament or Paul had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel of the Gentiles, or Paul was directly taught by other persons who knew the gospel. Those are the only three ways he could have been taught, he could have learned it. 
the only way one can learn the gospel was through either the written copy of the New Testament or through revelation from deity or direct teaching from a person who knew the gospel. Paul either had a New Testament or Paul had miraculous guidance or direct teaching by other persons who knew the gospel when he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. That's our conclusion right there. We're going to take this conclusion and we're going to put it down as part of our next form. That will become the first premise in the next argument. Paul either had a New Testament or Paul had miraculous guidance when he preached the gospel of Gentiles or Paul had direct teaching of, by the person who knew the gospel. Paul did not have a New Testament when he preached the gospel of the Gentiles. This is axiomatic because the New Testament didn't exist at that time. Okay. So now we draw the conclusion that Paul either had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel to the Gentiles, or Paul had direct teaching by the person who knew the gospel. With that, it's long drawn out, but we have to take this as our first premise. Right. So Paul either had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel or the Gentiles, or Paul had direct teaching by other persons who knew the gospel. Paul did not have direct teaching by other persons who knew the gospel evidence. Paul did not confer with flesh and blood. Conclusion, Paul had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. Does that make sense? That's our my argument. Any questions? That's my proof that he had this direct guidance from deity. And I, I would argue that it had to be either by visions, dreams, vision and or dreams and or uh, the, you know, the deity actually took him back in time and let him see these things. I, I think it was probably through visions that he was allowed to see these things, and I think the visions let him see exactly what Jesus taught. And he, he could see the things taught by Jesus. <clears throat> it's almost the same as if he went back in time and viewed it. Like it had a video recording of it, if you know, like we would think of. It took everything he said and all the context of it, too. And Paul said it. If Paul had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel of the Gentiles in Paul, he had miraculous guidance from a direct impartation of miraculous powers or by laying on hands of an apostle. Right. He had miraculous guidance from deity when he preached the gospel. We can see that he either had miraculous guidance by direct impartation of miraculous powers or by laying on the hands of an apostle. Now, <clears throat> so we take that as our her first premise, Paul did not have miraculous guidance by the laying on of hands. How do I know of an apostle? How do I know Paul did not confer with flesh and blood? That would include the laying on of hands. Paul had miraculous guidance from the direct impartation of miraculous power. Paul received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's my argument. It's direct impartation directly from God. Any question? All right, now let's get back to verse 16. Paul, uh, how did you translate it there, Chris? I have uh, to reveal his son um, in me, even me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Immediately I consulted not with flesh and blood. Okay, it's right away. Immediately. immediately it's probably a little better modern English translation. And to really sign among me, in me, or by me. I put notice by me. And I probably ought to put this me as emphatic. Let me do that. I'll just add that to it. This uh, comes up in a different font, courier, courier font. I haven't figured out how to get it out of that mode. I'm 
is in here. Here we go. All right. Okay, that might help. All right, emphatic. How do we know it's emphatic? That was help me out. I've highlighted the pronoun. Hey boy. It begins with an epsilon. Yeah. If it weren't emphatic, it would be boy without the epsilon and with the accent mark on it. Synthetic, it would go with the word before it. Okay. All right. All right. Do you have any other add things to add to the translation there, uh, James? No, sir. Uh, mine pretty much matched what you have. I, I didn't use straightway, but I used uh, immediately. Okay, probably immediately is probably um, for modern English. I'd be more better, as the old country boy said. Okay, uh, Chris, <laughs> thank you for the last one. James, can you do this one? Yes, sir. Please. Uh, Ude enalphone ace ye rose soluma plus pro emu apostolus a la enalphone ace. Arabian Kai Palin, Yupa Strepsa, Ace Damascon. And I translated this uh, Neither did I go into Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I departed into Arabia and again I returned into Damas Damascus. Okay. So neither today, notice it's a compound of. Who and they, and I highlighted here, and you see what I'm talking about. And it always reaches back, and remember, it always reaches back and pulls the negation from the prior. They reaches back and go back several words. So it pulls this negation. It did not confer with flesh and blood. And then it continues that not with who. And they pulls it and brings it in. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to the more apostles before me. And go up to Jerusalem. It's going to Jerusalem. You're going south. And we say in Oklahoma, when you go south, we say go down. But why does it say go up? Because Jerusalem has a higher elevation. Has a higher elevation than Damascus. That's true. That's it. I always does. When I said go up, they went up. When it says they're going down, they went down. All right. They went to a higher place. To Jerusalem. To them that were, to the ones that were apostles before me. And me, again, is emphatic. All right. That would include Matthias. But, say, I didn't go to Jerusalem, where'd I go? See, but Allah gives you a new category of things. But if I didn't go to Jerusalem, where to the boss, where'd I go? Well, I went into where? Arabia. Arabia. Now, Arabia, uh, that's not the country of Saudi Arabia, but it's part of the same land. But uh, I went away into Arabia. And this was between Acts 9, 22, and 23, I think. This occurred between those two verses. And we don't learn of it here until here, of it until here. This occurred in AD 40, and how do I know? But because he tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 32, in Damascus, the governor under Aratus, king, king kept the city of Damascus with the garrison, Designed to apprehend me and threw a window in the basket. I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Now, who is this Aratus? He's the king of Arabia, and he was in control of Damascus at that time. Okay? Here's what had happened. And here's Thayer gives you this information. 
Aratus, it's the name common of many of the kings of Arabia, Petra, and the, the, set, the place called Petra is uh, one of their cities. And these are the Nabathian, the these would be Arabia, and the Arabian king who made war in AD 36 on his son in law, Herod. So this occurred somewhere around AD 36. All right. All right. So right here. So around AD 36, this happened. And so this this uh, conversion of, of Saul of Tarsus happened. Right. And here a name common to many of the kings of Arabia, not AD. And so uh, he, he made war with his son-in-law, Herod Antipas for having repudiated his daughter. So he married her and Antis married this Arabian king's daughter and he divorced her so he could marry another woman. And so he brought his army and made war against him. Josephus Antiquities 18.5 tells us about it. In consequence of this, Atelius, governor of Syria, being ordered by Tiberius to march an army against Aratus, prepared for war. But Tiberius, meantime, died in March 6 of AD 37. He recalled his troops from the march and dismissed them to the winter quarter to depart Rome. After his departure, Aratus had to help sway over the region of Damascus. How, how acquired, we do not know, and placed an ethnarch over the city. In this passage, we see Paul records it in 2 Corinthians 9 and 32, so we know it happened. Does that help? So we have a time frame here. So he went to Arabia. Now, where did he go? Well, we see later he went to Mount Sinai. Okay. I will see that. We'll see that in uh, that Mount Sinai is in Arabia and may have gone to Mount Sinai. So I'll back up with him and say we know for sure he went to Mount Sinai. And again, I returned. See, after that, I returned to Damascus. And then let's go to Acts 26 and 19. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared both of them at Damascus first and at Jerusalem and throughout all the country of Judea. Also, the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, doing works while they repentance. So he began his preaching in Damascus. So he returned back to Damascus. Right. So this occurred at the time of the events of Acts 9, but we're just not recorded in Acts 9. So there's a, there's a sequence probably of some time here. He went up to Jerusalem to them or possibly before me, but I went up into Arabia. And again, I returned in Damascus. This sounds like it happened quickly, but there appears to be some period of time in which this occurred. And go to my notes on 2 Corinthians 11, 32 and 33 and get more information about it. We're not going to do that right now unless you have questions. We can do that next week. All right, do you have questions? Now, then after three years, we'll come back to this next week. If you want me to, I can. we can look at my notes on 2 Corinthians 11, 32 and 33 and see some more information about this, the more information I derive from 2 Corinthians and put all this together logically. Maybe we need to do that. I think I probably will. Okay. So let's start with verse 18 next week and, and study first segments 11, 32, and 33 with it, if you will. Are there questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, if we're Gal Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, um, you were one of your my classmates said something about a, a rule because one of the thes was missing. Could you yeah. tell me what that rule was again? Granville's Granville Sharp's rule. It's here. Uh, 
kind of those drugs. Throw the Greg Sentax, okay? That's the rule. All right. Now, I'll send you a file that has it in there and you search there and just uh, control H and type in Granville or Granville, okay? And you'll you'll find it in this file. Okay. I'll try to get into that file right now if we can and see what we got. See if I can get into it. All right. So let me see here. Get out of this. Stop sharing. I'll go back and share. All right. Can you see the light the voice says likes can tell us? Yes. This is uh, this is Ray Summers Greek grammar book. When two nouns are joined by the conjunction chi, a if both nouns have the definite article, they refer to different persons or things. If the first of the two nouns has the article, and the second does not. The two are the one person or thing. It's Ray Summers Greek grammar book. And then well, Danny and Mandy. Tell us when the copulative chi connects two nouns of the same case. If the article whole or any of its cases precedes the first and of the said nouns or participles and is not repeated, see it focuses with participles as well, and is not repeated before the second noun or participle, the latter always relates to the same person that is expressed. And it, Describe by the first noun or part. So that is not the further description of the first name person. A.T. Robertson in his big grammar, big grammar, a lot of historical research said groups treated as one. Sometimes groups more or less distinct are treated as one for the purpose of hand and hence use only one article. This is probably more frequent examples where the gender occurs also with some other attributes. Right. Daniel Wallace in his big in his modern his grammar, which is uh, big grammar, grammar beyond the basics by Daniel Wallace, pages 270 to 277. He has an extensive discussion. Uh, Vaughn and Getty in their iterated grammar says it has a special use. Uh, in some more Perschbacher and some others. Okay, and does that help you? That help a bit there, Russell. Yes, it did help. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. I'll get out of it. And let me stop recording now.